We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Ordinary People on September 19th, 1980. It was written by Alvin Sargent, based on the novel by Judith Guest, with uncredited writing from Nancy Dowd, directed by Robert Redford, and released by Paramount Pictures. In 1976, author Judith Guest's first novel, Ordinary People, was published. Robert Redford actually bought the rights to the manuscript before it was published, intending not to act in it, but make his directorial debut with the film. The film went on to win Best Picture, Director, Supporting Actor, and Adapted Screenplay, only the third time that a first-time director scored Best Picture prize after Delbert Mann for Marty and Jerome Robbins for West Side Story. Mary Tyler Moore was nominated for her performance, but Donald Sutherland was only nominated for the Golden Globe, which is regarded by some as one of the biggest snubs in the history of the Academy Awards. Not sure I that's the biggest. I think that's a huge snub. Maybe, maybe that year it was one of the biggest. Maybe. Judd Hirsch was also nominated for his supporting role, losing to Timothy Hutton in a role praised by the psychiatric community as one of the rare times that their profession is shown in a positive light on film. At least at the time, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, yes, in general, it's a positive light. Like, I think he, he plays it well and stuff like that. But yeah. a lot of people rag on it in the film. I mean, or at least the mom does right. a lot. And I, I think the movie was to show that you, you when you watch this movie, you're on the psychiatrist side. You're not right. on the family side. Correct, yes. Where you have a movie like Dress to Kill, where you're not necessarily rooting for the psychiatrist the whole time. Yeah. Richard Dreyfuss was originally considered for the role of the psychiatrist, but when Robert Redford called him, Dreyfuss said, I can't talk to you right now. I'm having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and he hung up the phone. <laughs> Gene Hackman was offered the role first, but had to bow out for Superman 2 reshoots. Oh. And Judd Hirsch was only available for nine days to avoid interfering with Taxi's shooting schedule. Wow. Lee Remick and Anne Margaret were suggested for the role of Beth, but Redford had seen Mary Tyler Moore standing alone on the beach that bridged their properties one morning and read the novel with her in mind. Paramount was insistent that Redford play the Calvin role, but he refused, auditioning Bruce Dern and Ken Howard before casting Donald Sutherland, Redford's first choice for the psychiatrist, Dr. Berger. I would, have, I would have liked Bruce Dern in there, I think. I think that would have been good. I don't know. Middle-aged crazy Bruce Dern? Yeah, that was a bad movie. Yeah. I don't think he's a bad actor. No. I just, uh, I would have, I don't know. He has a different taste. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why I find that funny. I don't know. I, I, I don't think know. it would have been good. I like Sutherland in the role, though. Uh, evidently, Sutherland at the time was tired of playing oddball eccentric characters. So he was like, can I just, can I be the dad? I don't, I don't want to be this psychiatrist character. Michael J. Fox auditioned for the Conrad role. I don't know if that would have worked no, at all. No, no. I mean, it, I feel like he, well, because we had him in Midnight Madness. Right, and and he. But that seemed, was just kind of like, Ugh, you forgot my birthday. I'm gonna pet a dog. But he also seemed a little young. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this needed a more subtle, moody actor to play, not yeah. not goofy. Emilio Estevez and Sean Penn were also considered. Rob Lowe pursued the role, but was unable to get an audition. Kay Lenz was offered the role of Janine Pratt, but turned it down. Oh. Yeah. Actress Elizabeth McGovern was a student at Juilliard during the production and received the first ever exception from the school allowing her to appear in a film during the school term, provided her scenes were shot exclusively on Saturdays. Huh. Timothy Hutton's father passed away shortly before the production, but he said that it didn't inform his performance at all. Mary Tyler Moore lost her sister to a drug overdose during the making of the film, and less than a month after the film's release, her son died at 24 from an accidental gunshot wound to the head. So she actually lost her son less than a month after this movie came out. That's horrible. This, would, this movie would be impossible to watch in her situation. We open with Paco Bell's Cannon playing over a shot of Lake Michigan in the fall. It's pretty much the only song that we hear throughout the whole movie. That's true. In different, different variations. 
We move into a chorus of students singing lyrics to Paco Bell's canon that Jesse and I yeah. didn't know it had. Uh, in Every the back, song has lyrics if you work hard enough. That's true. In the silence of our souls, oh Lord, we In the back row of students, we I see our... I expected you to start singing uh, Lawrence. Lawrence <laughs> of Arabia. <laughs> In the back row of the students, we see our lead character, Conrad, as played by Timothy Hutton, just behind Elizabeth McGovern as Janine. Suddenly, we see Conrad sitting up in bed, basted in sweat. We cut to a scene from a community theater production of Same Time Next Year that Conrad's parents, Calvin and Beth, are in the audience for. Coincidentally, this play was adapted into a film two years earlier, in 78, where the lead role was performed by Alan Alda, who famously shares the role of Hawkeye Pierce in M.A.S.H. with Donald Sutherland playing Calvin here. Beth seems amused by the play, and Calvin seems asleep. Returning home from the play, Beth heads straight to their room, but Calvin can't help but give Conrad's door a quick knock. Before answering, Conrad props himself up pretending to read a book, and Calvin asks if he's called the doctor that he recommended. Conrad insists that he doesn't need a doctor, and their agreement was that he would only call one if he needed one. The next morning, Conrad is late coming downstairs for breakfast. His favorite, French toast. Father Calvin calls to him repeatedly, and Conrad eventually shouts down, I'll be right there. Conrad informs them that he isn't especially hungry, and even though it's his favorite, he's not quite up to it. Beth quickly snags his breakfast back and literally pushes two pieces of French toast into the garbage disposal like a maniac. Yeah. Just put it in the trash. Because you can't keep French toast. Yeah. He's like, what are you doing? And she's like, you can't keep French toast. Conrad rushes out to catch his ride to school with Lazenby. Calvin seems at least happy that he's socializing. Conrad's friends pull up, and he hops into the back seat. None of them seem to pay him any special attention. They pull up to a railroad crossing, and Conrad is disturbed by the dinging of the railroad crossing. Uh, get something lighter, you know, for your head. <laughs> I hope this is a long train, because i got to get this stuff down. You know, I'm going to flunk this test. So uh, I had read the synopsis for this movie, which is not something I usually do for a movie that I uh, actually genuinely want to watch, because I didn't want to know too much about this going yeah. in. I generally don't listen to anything Patrick says at the end of the episodes, <laughs> just so I'm surprised by the movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so I did read, and it says like that there's one son was dead, and the other son had a suicide attempt. It's like so I kept waiting for this kid to try to try kill and himself. kill himself. <laughs> Thought he was gonna get out and run in front of the like, train. Yeah, I'm like, oh, this is it. And then like something else happens. Like, oh, okay, this is when it's gonna happen. Um, especially later when he, uh, we'll get to it when, when he calls the doctor, like sweating. It's like oh, he's trying to reach out. This is his last, his last oh. ditch effort to reach out. This is gonna happen any minute now. Uh, so I kept like, I was just getting so anxious <laughs> waiting for it to happen, <laughs> and then only to realize that that it's already happened. Yeah, this is this is why he is in the hospital at the beginning, or before the beginning. They notice a female classmate, Janine Pratt, walking to school and call out, Pratt, you have nice knees! Out the window. We see Conrad spacing out in class a bit, sitting by himself watching other people practice sports. He stops at the hall payphone to call Dr. Berger and try to make an appointment. The doctor's with another patient and can't speak now. He offers to take Conrad's number and call him back, but Conrad says he doesn't think he'll be available later. I think that means... I don't want you to call me at home because my parents might intercept it. Right. I thought it meant that he was going to be dead. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to wow. be around it's later. a whole different flavor to the film. <laughs> I, know, you watch. I kept waiting for it. It was like, this was his last ditch effort to reach out. And the and the psychologist uh, or psychiatrist isn't giving him enough attention yeah. when this yeah. is a car- call for help. Yeah. Though it does seem unprofessional of Dr. Berger to answer the phone in the middle of a session. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Over dinner, Beth asks her son if a shirt he's wearing has a hole in it and tells him to leave it on the table after they eat so she can fix it. She asks if he wants her to sign him up for the round robin at the club, and he says he hasn't played in forever. And she's like, that's why I wanted to sign you up. She also informs Calvin that they'll be heading to a birthday party for Clark Murray soon. We get a quick shot of Conrad and his brother in a storm around an overturned boat on Lake Michigan, shouting at each other and trying to hold hands over the boat from opposite sides. The next day, Conrad walks into the doctor's office to visit him in person. In the elevator on the way up, he rehearses speaking with the doctor to avoid sounding crazy, presumably. The doctor invites him in, and he fiddles with a speaker system for a moment before music plays loudly and he shuts it off. He invites Conrad to take a seat. He asks Conrad how long he was in the hospital, and he says, four months. What did you do? I tried to off myself. Isn't it down there? It doesn't say what your method was. Double-edged, super blue. 
Ah. Which I was like, that sounds really cool. <laughs> but I don't know what it means. I, I think it's a kite type of razor. It is, is what a type I of razor. Yeah. I, I thought he said double edged super glue. <laughs> I was so like, he was just like that? a joke. Like, I glued myself to death. <laughs> like, I, I was like, I filled every orifice of my body with crazy glue. Yeah. And does glue only have two edges? <laughs> I thought every side of it worked. But it's actually a brand of razor, yes. Dr. Berger asks Conrad if he's having trouble at home with friends or at school. And he says, no. So Berger asks, why are you here? And Conrad says he would like a little more control so that people can quit worrying about him. Here is where we learn that Conrad had a brother who he lost in a boating accident. And Berger asks him to elaborate. Conrad doesn't say much and repeats that he would like control over himself so that people don't worry. Berger says he's not big on control. But if he's willing to pay for it, they can meet Tuesdays and Fridays every week for therapy, which is when I do my therapy, Tuesdays and Fridays, right here with you guys. Aww. <laughs> then why are we, we're the ones going crazy? Yeah. <laughs> He'll have to skip swim practice two nights a week to make this work. Conrad confides in his parents that night that he went to see a doctor, and Calvin is ecstatic, and Beth is horrified. Calvin has reasonable questions like, how did it go? And does it cut into your swim practice? And Beth wants to know where his office is, presumably to judge it or visit in person. At his next swim meet, his coach speaks with Conrad. He asks if he's having fun, because otherwise what's the point? And he also says that he notices that Conrad is yawning and asks if he's getting enough sleep. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> then he asks if Conrad is on any medications or tranquilizers, which crosses the line into inappropriate territory. And, and then... <laughs> and then finally, he asks... Did I already ask if they put you on electric shock therapy? And when Conrad confirms that they did, he basically calls him a pussy for letting them zap his brains and says, You know, I'm uh, no doctor, Jared. I would never have let them put electricity in my head. This is such an awkward conversation. <laughs> it's such a dick thing to say, too. Conrad is stopped in the hall by Janine Pratt, the girl he stands behind in choir. She says he has a lot of energy and he's smitten. At home, we're reminded again the time of year with Beth handing out caramel apples to trick-or-treaters. Later that night, Beth shares with Calvin her plans to celebrate Christmas in London this year. Calvin seems less excited about leaving Conrad on his own for the holidays. He's worried Conrad might have second thoughts about seeing this doctor, and he wouldn't be here to encourage him. Beth gets home alone one afternoon and briefly steps into Conrad's room to drop something off and then into Buck's room, which looks presumably exactly how he left it conrad comes home while she's sitting in there and startles her the two of them are so freaked out by the encounter that they can barely maintain a conversation afterwards i think this is a really nice reinforcement of how she's not processing this well right mm -hmm. eventually beth drops the pretense that they're having a friendly conversation and just says i bought you two shirts they're on your bed before slamming the door to her room we cut to beth and calvin on the way to a party and calvin votes that they head to a movie instead and beth says oh sure Let's do that. What'll be our excuse? And he's like, well, Beth wanted to see a movie. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Let's do that. And he's like, really? Okay, great. And then we just cut to them getting to the party mm -hmm. because what he wants to do doesn't matter. Uh, she tells Calvin not to have too much to drink and to embarrass her. And inside the party, we see them moving from conversation to conversation. <laughs> One guy stops Calvin mid-party just to tell him, I'm not talking to you. With a laugh. <laughs> and Calvin's like, why? <laughs> like, he seems like genuinely hurt. Uh, presumably this guy's wife told him not to talk to the father of the dead kid and he's had enough to drink that he forgot he shouldn't recite these instructions to Calvin. <laughs> Later in the party, Beth is mixing in with the crowd, being very social, singing loudly, and Calvin has taken a quiet seat on the stairs next to a woman who he's speaking with about Conrad. He mentions that Conrad is seeing a psychiatrist and Beth overhears this and looks furious. She's very embarrassed that her son is having trouble coping with the loss of his brother. The woman seems concerned at the mention of a doctor and asks if Conrad is still having problems, which I feel like is already a shitty thing to say. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like it's been that long since his brother died, yeah. let alone he since he tried to kill himself. I, I feel this way constantly in this movie that nobody is respecting their grieving process. Yeah. It's really frustrating. Like if this was six years later, I would still be hesitant to be like, Oh, is he still having problems? Like, that's not how I would word it anyway. I'd be like, oh, is he doing okay? Yeah, is he doing okay? Yeah. Has he been coping well? You know, like, it's not, is he having problems? But I feel like, and I'm not trying to be, like, 
classist or elitist here. I, but I feel like this is the t- the group of people who genuinely That's how they judge each other. Yeah, like they they genuinely don't share this kind of feelings with each other too often. So it's like to say, is he having problems? Like like he's not conforming. Yeah. No, it's just it's super frustrating to me throughout the movie. I mean, the mom is the worst example of this right. in terms of not understanding how he's coping. But I feel like repeatedly, you know, people at school, people at this party, they aren't respecting any sort of grieving process yeah. or, you know, healing. On the way home from the party, Beth yells at Calvin for sharing their family business. If she was just bothered on Conrad's behalf, it would be one thing, but she makes it very clear that she finds this a violation of the family's privacy, not just Conrad's, and she's indicating that she in particular is embarrassed. We cut to Conrad in Dr. Berger's office. Conrad says he's feeling jumpy and suggests he might need a tranquilizer. Berger disagrees and tells Conrad that he wandered in looking like something out of Body Snatchers, a film his father just starred in. 1978, Mm -hmm. Donald Sutherland. Conrad confides in him that he's considering quitting the swim team. He says he's still having a hard time with his friends. It was easier at the hospital because nobody felt the need to hide anything. Berger asks Conrad if there's anyone from the hospital he could reach out to besides Dr. Crawford. And I think it's going to be easier at the hospital because people aren't being total dicks to you all the time. Because everyone is equally infirmed and no one's like stands out as the problem character. Well, and everybody is, is... trying to help you reach your goal of finding you know a healthy way to live with what has happened yeah as opposed to you know basically accusing you of not being able to cope properly with this right but when he's prompted by Berger here he does seem to remember someone at the hospital that he thinks he could reach out to and we cut to him on a lunch date with Karen apparently the costume designer Bernie Pollock saw a girl wearing this outfit out shopping and he offered to buy her a whole new outfit if he could have what she was wearing because it was perfect for this character. I feel like I would have been very creeped out by this guy and just walked away. Yeah. <laughs> Until she saw the movie, I would assume that this girl just thought he wanted her clothes that smelled like her and didn't right? care. Right. <laughs> Karen tells him that she's been keeping busy with Drama Club. They're preparing for a performance of A Thousand Clowns and it's been very crazy. He asks if she misses the hospital and she says no. She asks if he's seeing a doctor and says she did for a while, but it didn't work out for her. Not that it won't work out for him. Yeah. You I, keep going. I, and the, I became really concerned now with this conversation was that she was seeing a, a psychiatrist and, it, and he didn't work out. I was like, oh, is it Dr. Berger? Because she said Dr. Crawford recommended him. Right. And I was like, and that's who recommended. Yeah. But Dr. Berger was like, was, were, and then I was like, were, was she seeing him as a psychiatrist? Yeah. As, 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 this information is never right. confirmed, but it might be confirmed in a line that Judd Hirsch says later. Uh, oh, true. Maybe. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I, I'll just say it like Judd Hirsch expresses genuine concern and upsetness in a piece of news. Yeah. Right. And I was like, oh, was that maybe he was the psychiatrist? Yeah, yeah, possibly. Karen says she has to go, but she encourages Conrad to have the best year of his life in spite of everything. He says he will call her. Later in the day, Beth sees Conrad relaxing on a chair in the yard and tries again to have a civil conversation with him. Conrad talks about a pigeon that used to get into their garage and how it's the closest thing they ever had to a pet. Buck used to ask for a dog constantly, but she never let him have one because anecdotally she doesn't like the crappy dog that the neighbors have. She doesn't try very hard here to have a civil conversation. She at least goes out and starts speaking with him on purpose, which she hasn't been doing so far in the movie. I guess. I just, I feel like she immediately becomes hostile. I think she wants credit for having talked to him at all, though. Well, and she becomes, she only becomes hostile when he starts mentioning Buck. Yeah. Uh, Everything was leading up to that was just like a butt stuff. And then, then he starts talking specifically, Buck wanted a dog, Buck wanted this, but you told Buck this and, and... That's when she starts kind of going off the rails. Yeah. She's she's just an incredibly self-centered person right. in this film. Everything has to relate back to her. And it's yeah. just the most horrible thing that a mom could do when you're trying to help your child is think about how this is about you. And anything that's not directly about her or what she wants to talk about is just like, it's completely insane that you're even saying any words that are not the words that I want to hear. Yeah. So she starts racing through all the excuses that they couldn't get a dog. And eventually the only thing Conrad can do to break through the sound of her voice is to just start barking at her. Mm-hmm. And every time that dog comes into this backyard and I try to get him out, he, 
<laughs> until she finally notices that it's happening and then she just points at the jacket that he has with him and says it's cold out here put that on she tells him to dress properly for the weather because he's outside and presumably embarrassing her in front of the neighbors. Conrad enters the home later and asks Beth if he can help set the table. She says no, but he can clean out his closet. And when he tries to talk to her, she just says, Because it really is a mess. Stop talking to me. Just do the thing I said to do. This also implies that she's going into his closet. Right. And so in the awkward silence here a phone rings and she runs to the distraction as fast as she can and tries to get into as long a conversation as she can with the person on the phone because yeah. she wants desperately not to talk to her son like she's like i'm not doing anything it's totally fine that you called right and and, and i mean that's proven by the fact that when he wants to have a conversation with her she just completely ignores him yeah. and says go clean your closet it's like wait, i was saying words that have nothing to do with that yeah uh, i also really like the the table as a setting for their meals uh, not i don't know it sounds weird but hey i don't know <laughs> <laughs> where are we going with this richard because <laughs> richard likes to eat on the floor <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't you no uh uh because they still set it up as if there's four people at the table right they don't they don't like have the tables be- aren't ro- or the chairs aren't rotated around it yeah like they don't have like beth and calvin sitting on one side and Conrad sitting on the other they still have it as a one person gets occupies each position on the table and the fourth is empty yeah the the first glimpse of that you get is when they're setting up for breakfast and she brings three orange juices to the table and she forms a right angle with them instead of making like a regular triangle triangle. there's one two three and then there's just nothing here even though there's still a chair sitting at the table there beth is laughing on the phone with whoever called and through conrad's eyes we flash to uh a scene with all of them from before buck died in the backyard and she's just laughing hysterically at all the jokes that buck is telling back with dr Berger, conrad talks about the communication problems he's having with beth but he switches to a story about when he first heard that bucky had died uh, from his father i guess when they found the body probably and he couldn't feel anything all he could think about was john boy on the waltons would have said something about how he felt but he couldn't even conjure up a feeling coincidentally john boy walton was played by Richard Thomas, who he just had as Shad, the Luke Skywalker of Battle Beyond the Stars 11 days ago. We see Calvin walking with a co-worker, maybe his boss, but I think, I, I can't really tell. The guy tells Calvin that he seemed lost lately. I've known you for 20 years. You think I can't tell when something's wrong? What is this guy even saying? <laughs> I don't understand. He clearly knows this guy's kid died recently yeah. mm-hmm. and that his other kid was in the hospital for a long time. Why would you pretend like noticing it bothers him is some kind of astute observation (laughs) like i know you you don't like it when your kids almost die he asks or actually die (laughs) he asks how conrad is doing and cal says oh he's doing okay and the co-worker says look i'm sorry it's none of my business but i think you worry too much after all it's been months since he tried to kill himself and weeks since he got home from the hospital you gotta let him go sometime the guy says that he's trying to give cal the benefit of his experience which is worth jack shit to someone in an absurdly different situation than the guy with a happy, healthy kid. On the bus home, Calvin has a flashback of breaking up a fight between his children and then years later pounding on Conrad's bedroom door before we see Conrad loaded into an ambulance. He overhears the EMTs describe his son's condition. The cuts are vertical. He clearly meant business. We see Conrad at swim practice and he quits the team. The coach is a big dick about it, pretending this will ruin Conrad's life. He's like, I don't understand why you want to ruin your life. He's like, mm-hmm. I don't think quitting the swim team is yeah. going to ruin my life. Well, I yeah. think he means ruin his life. Right. As the coach, as we'll come to see later, that he... He needs him. Yeah. Maybe. Well, but also, when you're a high school swim coach, you probably do think that swimming is people's lives. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, you try to make your chosen profession important. And also, it, to me, like, I don't know if he chose swimming to maybe be cathartic. like, Or if he was just following his brother into it. Yeah, like it's like had I been a stronger swimmer, or if he had been a stronger swimmer, like I don't know, like I I feel like there's some kind of metaphor or some kind of symbolism in the fact that other than just following in his brother's footsteps about being out on the water. Yeah, but even his friends are giving him shit about it. Like mm-hmm. it's not even just the coach that's like you can't quit the team. This is going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Like even his friends who who for sure know better are yeah. like, dude, why would you quit the team? And it's like, oh right, because your brother drowned. That's probably like 
traumatic. You well, don't need to think about it. Do whatever the fuck you want because it's I'm not stressful. Yeah. It's stressful to be part of a competitive sport and have to practice every day and wake up early and 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 you're also doing school and you're going through trauma. Like but he give also, the guy a break. And, and the point that he makes is a legitimate one that his friends just shoot down immediately. He says, I don't know, it kind of bores me because it's like I realize that there are things that are a billion times more important yeah. than a swim meet. And right. so I don't care about it anymore. And his friend's like, oh, that's a bullshit answer. It's like, fuck you, it's a bullshit answer. Yeah. That's that's my truth. Yeah. Dr. Berger asks what his parents think, and he says he hasn't told them yet. Berger pushes him to express himself openly, even if it means telling him to fuck off. He says, a little advice about feeling, kiddo. Don't expect it always to tickle. We cut to Beth's parents' home, where everyone's posing for awkward family photos. They switch up the people in the picture several times before Calvin stupidly suggests one of Conrad and Beth. Beth is so grossed out by her weak son that she can't stand to even be in a photograph with him and shouts at Calvin to give her the camera so she can take pictures of someone else. Eventually, Conrad is pushed over the edge and just says, Give her the goddamn camera! In the kitchen later, we get a taste of the source of Beth's neuroticism. Grandma wants to know, what reason a suicidal, newly only child would have to see a psychiatrist. I thought we were all finished with that. She wants to know the doctor's name and is a little bothered by the Jewish sounding name. And we cut back to the choir lesson that started the film with Conrad singing behind Janine Pratt. After class, she tells Conrad that he's a terrific tenor, which is a little funny because apparently he's actually a baritone. <laughs> it's a little funny. It's a little funny. <laughs> He asks, <laughs> unless she's making his like, you're a terrific tenor, terrible baritone. Yeah. <laughs> he asks how she can hear him while singing, which reminds me of the line from Ghostbusters. You're the best one in your row. Oh, thank you. You're good. Most people can't hear me with a whole orchestra playing. As they walk to the bus together, she asks Conrad what kind of music he likes. And I don't understand the exchange that follows. So hopefully a listener can clue us in. He says he likes modern jazz and folk rock. But then he says, spoon on a glass. <laughs> and she replies, spoons on a glass. Oh, you mean like tablespoon? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> why do I ask dumb questions? I don't know why spoons on a glass means tablespoons <laughs> or what that has to do with music or why asking someone what music they like is a dumb question. So if anybody out there has any idea, <laughs> feel guess, free to tweet us. I guess just clinking spoons on a glass. You know, you got a, d different levels of water in each glass. So it's like makes a tone i don't i don't know as she jumps on the bus she reminds him that he's a terrific tenor and he sings back oh you just saying that and then he sings hallelujah the whole way home because i guess he's excited about attention from someone yeah when he gets home he calls karen's home and her mother says oh she's not home from school yet so he leaves a message i don't know if that's the truth here yeah i hope it is or i mean other than she's probably just missing yeah he finds Janine's phone number in the phone book and practices speaking with her before calling. Hello, Janine. This is Conrad. 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 What a dumb name. Hello, Janine. This is Bill. Like he just <laughs> literally changes his name. That, that won't be more confusing. He asks her on a date and she greedily accepts. We cut to Calvin and Conrad bringing a Christmas tree home. Beth is not impressed either because the tree looks like shit or because this means they're having Christmas at home this year. Turns out it's neither. She just heard from Lazenby's mom that Conrad quit the swim team. Conrad flips out on her, claiming she only cares because someone else knew first, and he points out that she doesn't even care about him. She even went jet-setting around the country when he was in the hospital and never came to visit him once. Calvin tries to make bad excuses for her because he's an expert firefighter and just wants everybody to be happy no matter how wrong anyone is. He claims she came to the hospital but she couldn't come inside because she had a flu and that Conrad knows that. For four months, she had the flu so right. bad she couldn't go into the hospital. Conrad says she would have come if Buck was in the hospital and she replies, Buck never would have been in the hospital. That's enough. At which point Conrad just heads to his room. In the book, she takes this a step further, oh, adding, God. if you had done your job and protected your brother, you wouldn't have been there. So she really does blame him for Freely this. admitting she blames Conrad for Buck's death. See, I, I mean... I guess that does take it a step further because at this point I feel that she she just thinks that he is not strong and that his inability to cope with this is is him being weak. But she but, thinks it's literally his fault that Buck didn't come back. So his not being strong is his fault that her favorite son is dead. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I for me the moment that hit home the hardest will be later for between her and him but we'll get to that yeah calvin follows conrad upstairs in an effort to help or understand but beth is content with where they left it she's mad at calvin for always taking their son's side every time in conrad's room calvin pleads for his help understanding and conrad says he just doesn't see things when calvin asks for an example he gives him a pretty clear one he says that she hates me dad can't you see that she hates me Instead of listening and processing this, he just hears his son in pain and tries to cheer him up by saying, oh, no, she doesn't, instead of actually stopping to think about it and realizing, oh, you're right, she does fucking hate you. Yeah, or at least she's saying things that would indicate as such. Yeah. Conrad can see that he's not getting anywhere with his father and just says, you're right, she doesn't, please leave me alone, because this isn't going to be a productive conversation. In the next conversation with Berger, Conrad defends his mother's actions. Look at all the towels I ruined trying to kill myself. And then he has a little Freudian slip and they both catch it. If you think I'm going to forgive it, she's going to forgive me. And they both realize what just happened. And he, he finally comes to terms with the fact that he can't forgive her. And it's not as much her being pissed off at him, but the fact that he hates her for the way that she's been her entire life. And that she only cared about this other son the whole time. And Berger tells him it might be helpful to recognize her limitations and accept that she does love him, but not as much as he needs her to, or that she's not capable of showing it. But even before he can forgive her, he would benefit from forgiving himself. And Conrad asks, what for? But time is up. Calvin hears his family's voices echoing in his head while he's out for a jog and eventually collapses. He makes an appointment with Berger himself, which I guess is against the rules it's uh, psychiatrists aren't allowed to see two members of the same family separately they can do it in a family group yeah but they're not supposed to see two people as separate patients absolutely makes sense calvin admits that beth doesn't have the same affection for conrad that she did for buck and when cal gets home from the appointment he tries to ask beth about something that's bothered him from the day of buck's funeral beth would rather pretend that buck never died So she doesn't want to have this conversation and tries to divert it at every pause and convince Cal that even a discussion is an act of lunacy. He says that she complained about what he was wearing to the funeral and it's always bothered him because obviously it doesn't matter what he wore. And somehow they hug it out after this conversation. I don't don't get why they, they come to terms with each other here. I don't either. I mean, she's clearly not even willing to to process this with either her husband or her son. So I just don't really understand why either of them are giving her the time of day it's just like i need to go deal with this so this crazy lady here that can't handle this you need to just be out of our lives yeah and i think she literally just walks up to hug him to pretend that she's having some emotional breakthrough to shut him up just like if i hug you will you accept that this Mm -hmm. conversation is over so that i can do what i wanted to do yeah we cut to them eating in a food court at a mall somewhere and calvin brings up the option of them all seeing dr Berger together but beth obviously sees counseling as a sign of weakness and would rather pretend that buck is just on some long vacation somewhere than face any of their underlying problems as a family she implores him to drop it she makes plans for a trip for the two of them to visit her brother in houston they could just leave conrad wherever because he's barely a human i wonder if their marriage would have done better if conrad had died too or if conrad had died only oh for sure that would have been fine yeah but if Conrad had died also, I actually think they would have been better. I can't help but compare this to, well, one, I can't help but compare this to Dewey Cox. <laughs> Wrong okay. kid died. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I also think about um, the emotional aspect of it from Stand By Me with Will Wheaton's character mm-hmm. dealing yeah. with the John Cusack death and his breakthrough that his parents don't talk to him or even acknowledge that he's alive yeah we cut to conrad taking janine on a bowling date she warns him in advance that she's a funny bowler (laughs) and she is Uh, they head out to fast food afterwards and she asks him about his scars and if it hurt somehow nobody has asked him about this before and he doesn't quite remember he tries to explain the thinking behind his attempt but while he's talking about it a crowd of boys from their class burst into the restaurant and start harassing them and like picking their food out of their plates and she's laughing at their hijinks so conrad just clams up completely yeah. we we get uh this is like another moment where we have pachelbel's cannon playing but each note is held for like a good 15 seconds yeah it, it's just like this long drawn out version of the song yeah 
On the drive home, Conrad seems very upset that she thought this was so funny, and he won't let her talk, basically, for the whole ride home. We cut to Beth and Calvin landing in Houston. They golf with her brother for a while. We cut back to Lake Forest at a swim meet. Conrad is watching the home team lose without him. Outside afterwards, his friends say they could have used him, but then admit they probably would have lost anyway. Stillman asks Conrad if he's gotten into Pratt's pants yet, which kicks off a quick argument between the two that ends with Conrad punching Stillman out. When Conrad tries to leave, Lazenby hops in his car and tries to reach out to him. You know, I miss him too. Connie, the three of us were best friends. Conrad says that it's too hard to even be with Lazenby anymore because of that, and he tells him to go, so he does. Conrad comes back to Grandma's house late at night, and Grandma is discreetly waiting up for him. He goes to dig Karen's phone number out of the book he's been reading this whole movie, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, by the way. And he calls Karen's home on the phone, her parents answer, and tell Conrad very bluntly that she is dead. She killed herself. And presumably that's why she was missing the last time he called. He has a panic attack, and we see much more of the boating accident, with the two of them trying desperately to stay afloat, and his brother just kind of sinking out of the shot and life. He prepares to cut his wrists open again, and instead splashes water across his face and runs outside to call Dr. Berger. Berger agrees to meet with him immediately, and Conrad starts the session in tears, apologizing to Bucky, and Berger very quickly sees what's happening and takes up the Bucky role. Berger, as Bucky, admits that he let go and drowned because he got tired, and Berger points out that the reason Conrad survived was because he was probably stronger. Now Conrad reveals that Karen died, and she was just fine a few days ago, but Berger points out, no, she wasn't. Yeah. Like, she clearly was not okay, and just because someone tells you they're okay, it's the equivalent of you telling your dad that you're okay. Mm -hmm. And and this is when he says, I'm really upset about Karen, and, and Dr. Berger goes, I am too. Yeah. And I was like, that's where I got kind of the hint. Maybe he was yeah. her, her psychiatrist as well. Or, or even just that first line when he's like, Karen killed herself. And he's like, oh, God. Like, mm -hmm. it just immediately hits him really hard. And it's not just because he knows this is someone important to Conrad. Also, as emotional as this scene is, I really just couldn't take my eyes off of Conrad's weird coat. I don't, I don't know what it was. Oh, yeah. Like, it, it, like it, the saber tooth, like, fur line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like a aviator flight jacket or something like that i was like or or putty's infamous coat from seinfeld yeah i was just like oh this coat is just really distracting me yeah from and he scene. tried to take it off but the doctor was like no 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 put it back on <laughs> yeah it's very weird conrad's getting a taste of what his father went through when he tried to kill himself he wishes out loud that bad things didn't have to happen to people you do one wrong thing he says and Berger asks what Conrad did wrong, hinting at their previous session, and now Conrad knows what he did wrong. What he did wrong was survive the accident. Berger insists that this should be a mistake that he can live with, and when Conrad asks how Berger knows living is better, he says, because I'm your friend. Conrad worries out loud what he might have done if Berger weren't here, and he asks Berger again, are you really my friend? And he says, yes. And they hug. And I find this completely inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. I think as a therapist or psychiatrist, you cannot have a professional relationship with the client and be their friend. I yeah. think that you can help them on a professional level, but that is not the same thing as a friendship. And I think it's totally inappropriate of him to say this. Yeah. Because he wouldn't talk to him off the clock. We've already gone over that. Right. Then it's like a friend talks to you off the right. clock. But even mm. if even if you then did, then there's this weird thing of, well, why am I paying on you this, this hour? You pay me to talk to you. And then mm -hmm. I but I won't talk to you about certain things. off. The, you, you just can't mix those relationships. I mean, I understand the the want to do it here because he doesn't actually have any friends. Right. I get I get the desire to do that, but I don't think it's a. It, I don't think it's the professional thing to do. i agree it is it is unprofessional i would say well i mean i guess now's as good a time as any because i wanted to talk about this movie in a little bit with like goodwill hunting yes which obviously drew a lot from this relationship yeah. and and again a very similar professional relationship that's also a friendship yeah uh and i do i do feel like when he says that he's a friend and i don't know what in what version of that word that he means like like i'm i don't know if like he means like 
I'm your friend, like we can hang out kind of friend, or I'm not a person that you have to be antagonistic towards. Yeah, yeah I guess I guess it depends on how you're defining that word. But yeah, he's somebody that's I care about you in so much as I want you to do well. I want mm-hmm. you to cope with what you're going through. Right. I care what happens to you. But I think that friend is the wrong word for that. Yeah. Yeah. Ally, maybe, or something like that. Yeah. Not like, let's start a band. <laughs> I, have a, I have an open couch. Let's we should, ne- we should write a screenplay together. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should write a screenplay. Exactly. <laughs> That's what friends do. Conrad waits outside Janine's house the next day to apologize for his behavior. She admits she feels bad too and tries to explain that she just laughs when she's uncomfortable and that's why she laughed that night. She wasn't condoning the interruption of their very serious conversation. He asks if she's headed to school and she says, no, not on a Sunday, but we know from the production notes that this was a Saturday. (laughs) (laughs) Either way, she's not going to school. Right. That's true. There's no school center either. He asks to try again and maybe get something to eat, and she invites him into her home for breakfast. Back in Houston, Beth tells Calvin what a good time she's having, and they should plan another golfcation. Calvin says, Connie might like that, and Beth flies off the handle again because Calvin's pretending that Conrad is a member of their family or something. Cal says, Conrad just wants to know that you don't hate him, and Beth says, He doesn't even think that, and you're stupid for listening to him and hearing him say that he thinks that I hate him. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Beth shouts that she doesn't know what anyone wants from her anymore, like she's done anything for anyone in this whole movie. It's just been her jumping on vacations and drinking at parties and whatever she wants to do the whole time. She won't even talk about things that she doesn't want to talk about. Yeah. On the flight back home, Calvin looks at her and thinks of the early days in their relationship. Back at home, Conrad tells his parents that he's glad they're back and goes to hug his mom and she stiffens up like he's a goddamn murderer. Yeah. It's the most disturbing moment in the film. Yeah, she doesn't even make an attempt to hug him. And I think that it hits her too. Like, I do not... Right. I do not like this person. by your son. Yeah. How she doesn't realize that she actively hates him is really incredible. Or unless she's realizing it here, like, oh my God, you're right. I do fucking hate this person. Yeah. In the middle of the night, she realizes that Calvin has gotten out of bed and she finds him crying in the kitchen. He asks if she loves him and she says no as nicely as she can <laughs> by saying, I feel the way I've always felt about you. Ugh. Which means that's actually worse than yeah, no because it means I have never loved you because yeah. the answer is either yes or no. And if it's not yes, it's no. And if it's not no, it's I've never loved you. Ugh. That's so much harder. He tells her that he doesn't know her anymore and that he doesn't know if he loves her anymore. In the book, he never tells her this. She just leaves after a series of disagreements, but I think that this was actually a necessary oh, yeah. change from the book. I think this is more impactful because it's it's showing it's showing that he has an arc in, in that he's he's been really trying yeah. and, and 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 he's figured out that she's not going to change. But also the the author of the novel was worried that it would be really hard to portray the mother as sympathetic in any way to anyone and i feel like this is a change that at least she gets attacked by one person once in the movie Mm -hmm. even if it's not necessarily an attack it's just i don't know if i love you anymore but but she's feeling something yeah 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 or if if you are even deserving of love right she just walks away instead of responding to what he said because in her brain nothing unpleasant actually happens And on her way upstairs, she's probably making up a happy story about the conversation they just had as she packs her bags to leave forever. I disagree with that. I think the way she looks in this scene is that she's finally feeling something for the first time in this film and she doesn't like it. And so she's trying to run away from this. And it's it's very upsetting to her because she looks like she looks the same as she did when she was getting hugged. She I don't know. She looks like she's seen a ghost like she looks like. She's in shock. Yeah. Well, and it looks like she's desperately trying to not cry. Right. Like, she does not want to be emotionally affected by this. Yeah. This is the closest she comes to being a person because the truth is overwhelming her, and she shakes like a dysfunctional robot while she's filling her suitcase. Yeah. She's just, like, literally breaking down, trying to keep a straight face and just yeah. stare blankly ahead. Conrad wakes up in the morning to his mother leaving in a taxi, 
and asks Calvin what happened, he shares the good news with his son <laughs> that they can start healing together. Conrad tries to blame himself at first for his mom leaving, and Calvin says, cut it the fuck out. Things happen. And then he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. And he's like, no, 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 yell at me more. Yeah. Like, he used to yell at Buck all the time, and he's like, yeah, well, Buck was an idiot. Like, <laughs> I had to yell at him, and I never had to yell at you because you were too busy yelling at yourself all the time, and I felt like I was just going to destroy you if I if I added on to it. And they just tell each other they love each other here, and they hug in the yard, and that's where we end the film. Yeah. This was directed by Robert Redford, the Sundance Kid, founder of the Sundance Film Festival. He was in All the President's Men, The Sting, The Natural. He's Alexander Pierce in the MCU. He also directed The Malagro Beanfield War, A River Runs Through It, Quiz Show, Horse Whisperer, and The Legend of Bagger Vance. The novel was written by Judith Guest. She has this and a movie called Rachel River in 1987 on her IMDb. Writer Alvin Sargent wrote I Walk the Line, directed by Frankenheimer with Gregory Peck and Tuesday Weld, and Paper Moon, What About Bob, Hero, Spider-Mans 2 and 3, and the first Amazing Spider-Man. Uncredited writer Nancy Dowd also wrote Slapshot, Swing Shift, and Cloak and Dagger. Donald Sutherland played Calvin. We had him as Hawkeye Pierce in our Patreon MASH review. The same year he was in Kelly's Heroes. He's also John Clute in Clute. He plays Homer Simpson in Day of the Locust, <laughs> but he's also on The Simpsons. Yeah, uh, he's he, the, the head of the museum. <laughs> right. He was also Dave Jennings in Animal House, Matthew Bennell or Bennell in the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. We had him earlier this year in Nothing Personal, but he was later referenced in Blues Brothers on a billboard for the fictional Landis film See You Next Wednesday. I think it's a little crazy that he is in the Best Picture winner and literally the film that is at the bottom of my list for mm, 1980. Yeah. I That's don't weird. understand how he could have gotten there. He's got a range. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he also played Johann von Wolfhaus in Beer Fest. And he's in Backdraft, the first one and the 2019 direct-to-video sequel. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore was Beth. She plays Laura Petrie in 158 episodes of The Dick Van Dyke Show and Mary Richards in 168 episodes of The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Judd Hirsch was Burger. He played Alex Rieger on Taxi. He was Julius Levinson in Independence Day. He's Alan Epps on Numbers with Krumholtz. He's not currently doing that, but yeah. he was on that show for a while. He played Pop Pop Goldberg on the Goldbergs TV series. When I met him, he was guesting on Tom Goes to the Mayor, and we had to drive around to a bunch of army surplus shops to get him a jumpsuit because he was playing a prisoner in the episode. Very friendly guy. Uh, did you mention Dear John? I did not. Ah, Dear John. Good show. Dear John. Timothy Hutton was Conrad. He played Brian Moreland in Taps. He's Christopher Boyce in The Falcon and the Snowman. He's Colonel Kent in The General's Daughter. He plays Nathan Ford on Leverage. I think Leverage. he was in the season that you worked on. He's in all the seasons. I know. He's the main character. <laughs> <laughs> he also played Hugh Crane in the first season of The Haunting of Hill House, which is a cool show. Uh, M. Emmett Walsh was the swim coach. He's Private Detective Visser in Blood Simple, Bryant in Blade Runner, Harv in Critters, Dr. Dolan in Fletch. We had him earlier this year in Brubaker as the cheating contractor guy and as Master Chief Vinny Walker, part of the team that raised the Titanic in a little film called The Blues Brothers. No, that's it was called Raise the Titanic. <laughs> uh, I also just saw him in Knives Out as Mr. Proofrock, the guy who had the video recording of the nurse leaving the property. And this was his second collaboration with Redford this year after appearing in Brubaker together. Elizabeth McGovern was Janine. She was nominated for an Academy Award for her portrayal of Evelyn Nesbitt in Ragtime next year. She's also Deborah in Once Upon a Time in America. But right now, she's probably best known as Countess of Grantham Cora Crawley in Downton Abbey. She's so cute in this movie. I yeah. love it. When you when I figured out that she was the mom in Downton Abbey, I was yeah. like, oh my god, it is! <laughs> and also, she has aged wonderfully. Yeah, I, I honestly think she looks better now than she did in this I, movie. Well, I, I mean, she looks fantastic now, but I cannot believe that you know she was probably what 18 in this movie or something like that, some, yeah. something like that. and i'm like i thought would have thought she was much younger than that yeah and she has worked pretty consistently since this movie but she married a british filmmaker and moved to england where she has worked predominantly which is why she's sort of making a resurgence in america as this bbc export show yeah um, has become popular well she's like the only american on the show right 
Yeah. Dinah Manoff was Karen. She plays Marty in Greece, and she's also Maggie Peterson in Child's Play. Frederick Len played Joe. He was Bobby and Foxes earlier this year. He played a pilot in Con Air. He played Marshal Edward Mars on Lost. And he plays INS Agent Janice in Men in Black. James Sicking played Ray. He'll be back as Brusnell in the competition later this year. Sergeant Monotone in Outland. Dr. Harry Lewin in The Star Chamber. Captain Stiles in The Search for Spock. Basil Hoffman with Sloan. These are all kids from the swim team, I believe. Uh, Herb Lee in My Favorite Year. And Principal Dingleman in Square Pegs. <laughs> Quinn K. Redecker played Ward. He was the pilot in Where the Buffalo Roam. He was also Benjamin Leverington in Coast to Coast in 1980. Mary Claire Costello plays Audrey. She is Senator Cunningham in Buckaroo Banzai and Emily in Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Meg Mundy played the grandmother. She was Joan Rogerson in Fatal Attraction. Adam Baldwin played Stillman, the guy who gets in a fight with uh, Conrad. He plays Linderman in My Bodyguard later this year, later this month. Uh, Animal Mother in Full Metal Jacket. Garber in Predator 2. Noel Rohrer in five X-Files episodes. And Jane Cobb on Firefly. Jane, the man they call Jane. <laughs> That's my for my Firefly fans out there. There you go. Haven't seen a single episode yet. That's my bad. I, I binged that the week that I moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> I was Like in, 10 years ago? Oh, God, it's more than that now. But I, I had nowhere else to go. And the person whose couch I was sleeping on had the whole series on DVD. And I'm like, oh, what's this? And I watched every episode of it. <laughs> I feel like this, the whole series fits on one disc probably, right? That's it's only it's like 13 episodes. 13 episodes, yeah. Uh, Richard Whiting played the grandfather. He's the priest in Tootsie. And he plays an ancient puzzler in the Hudsucker Proxy. Stephen Hirsch played Mac. That's Rorschach from Airplane 2. Jane Alderman played Linda. That's Scott's mother in Poltergeist 3. Uh, she transitioned into casting and worked on Lucas, Ferris Bueller, Color of Money, Midnight Run, Child's Play, Major League, Backdraft, Rudy, Natural Born Killers, Candyman, and The Straight Story. Marilyn Rockefeller played Sarah. And she was also Helen in Defending Your Life. Mrs. Burroughs in Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, and Helen Smith in Nixon. What do you think, Jess? Uh, up or down on this one? I mean, I'm going to give it an up. It's it's a good movie. It's not my favorite kind of movie. Sure. Because, you know, there's nothing particularly wrong with it. Um, you know, it's well made on, in every respect. It's it's well acted. It's well shot. It's well written. Um but it's it's sort of it's as you say a character piece or a slice of life and and that's just not really my thing. Yep. Um. So it doesn't really go super high on my list. But you know, because I don't I don't ever think I need to watch this movie again. Yeah. This is not a movie that I would like to revisit. It frustrates me. I mean, I know the point is probably to be frustrated by right. the mother character, but that's not enjoyable to me to to watch a movie where i'm really frustrated by how these characters are being treated so yeah. it's it's not super it's not as high as it should be it's not best picture for me it's an up but it's it's just all right yeah richard uh i definitely give it an up and i will probably have it significantly higher on my list i think uh than jesse i i it's hard because I this was a movie that I watched after watching Mother's Day, and, and so this is like anything's gonna be like <laughs> mwah, just it got like, that Mother's brilliant. Day bump. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh, this is way more watchable. Uh, uh, I I enjoyed it. I had not seen it before. Uh, oh really? I, I had always I had always heard the title, but had and seen the 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 cover, and did not know what it was about. Yeah. Uh, it, it looked like a very boring movie from the cover, and I still think that the poster is very, very <laughs> Being boring. Being called ordinary people does not help. <laughs> Look at the poster again, now having seen the movie. Yeah. Do you get the point of the poster? Yes. Okay. Um, what does the poster look like? I it's don't remember. A, it's a three-fold like, picture frame, mm -hmm. and you can see Donald Sutherland and Mary Tyler Moore, but the picture of, uh, of Conrad is kind of folded away from camera because mm. he's not important mm -hmm. and you could tell that she set the pictures up that way because she okay. just wants to see her and her husband and she doesn't care about her other son but 
but f- coming from coming at it from like a not seen this movie before no or know nothing about it as like as a really boring looking like um, on golden pond kind yes. of esque <laughs> like another famous oscar nominee yeah <laughs> yeah I one of those in- stupid good movies <laughs> I was expecting more of a Kramer versus Kramer kind of thing out of this. Yeah. I um, feel like this is definitely in that line. I like Kramer versus Kramer, though. Oh, I liked Kramer, it more than fantastic. this. Well, well, yeah, because there's there's a fun, energetic thing to it. This is the opposite of that. <laughs> and, and I don't know if the title is meant to be like that, oh, look, in the long run, they are just ordinary people because they have ordinary people problems. Right. Because they're not ordinary people. <laughs> right. But they also don't make a huge deal about their wealth other than the fact that they can afford a psychiatrist mm-hmm. and that, that giant they freaking mansion in lake forest yeah but i don't think that plays a part in how the story is unfolding no. this would work just as well in a small house in the midwest yeah i mean i guess it's that they cope just as badly as the rest of us right <laughs> with life yeah well they've also been dealt a pretty shit hand yeah. um while boating out on lake michigan but yeah i give uh i give it a thumbs up um, I actually, I raised it up after having listened to us talk about it a little bit more because I realized there's more to this movie than the not much of a story that more you know, than bothers me. More than meets But it's still not super high because I feel like my list is the order in which I would watch the yeah. movies again or the order in which I would tell other people to watch the movies. And it's it's not really my cup of tea. So it goes one, two. It goes 12th on the list. Okay. It is below. <laughs> That's exactly uh, where Richard has it. It is below my brilliant career and above the changeling. All right. <laughs> <laughs> After all that, we have it in the exact same spot. <laughs> you and me, Richard, we're the same. Uh, I have it uh, just below the changeling um, and just above Saturn 3, which I know isn't anywhere near your top of the list. But <laughs> yeah. oh, I, actually, I like Saturn. It's not that far. Down. Yeah, Saturn 3, she it's actually pretty was pretty oh, okay. nice, too. Yeah. I give it a thumbs up. I really like this movie. I like character pieces, and I'm really a fan of the writing and all of the performances here. There, there's not a there's not a wrong note for me here. This is actually going in my number two slot. Whoa! Wow. So what's it dethroning? Just under The Shining Empire. and just above Forbidden Zone. Oh, Empire's fourth on your list. Now? Empire's fourth and Island is down to fifth, which wow. I feel terrible about. Oh my god! But um, I think that's where I have to put it because I actually really enjoy this movie, and I feel like. I connect with it emotionally every time on the same level that I connect with, you know, the the mother being like the nurse ratchet type in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where it's like anytime I can understand where a character is coming from and hate them that much, it's just fascinating to me. Hmm. Where it's like nothing she does confuses me. It's not that I don't understand where she's coming from. It's that I do. And it's just such, a, such an insane character to pull off mm-hmm. that it just – it's – blows me away every time i see it mary tyler moore is acting her ass off here and she's not in a lot of feature films like most of her work is television and most of it is like bubblegum happy you know television stuff so for her to even be offered this let alone to pull it off as flawlessly as she does blows me away but it goes in second place for me i thought about it for a really long time because i was like am i overdoing it but i think the shining is still above it for me it's a movie that yeah. that so far I would say is if you if you told me I've never seen anything from 1980 and I only have time to watch one before my car explodes I would say <laughs> just get out of your car buddy. <laughs> get but out if your they car couldn't, and watch these five if movies. their seatbelt was stuck or something I'd be like here's my laptop watch The Shining. Yeah, absolutely. And then give it to me back real quick because I need this laptop for my podcast. <laughs> and you die. Um, but yeah, that's where it goes for me. I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we're Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash Vintage Video Podcast. And on that note, I'd like to give a special shout-out to Steve08 for his iTunes review. Thank you so much, Steve-O. I think I might know who you are. Maybe not. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing In God We Trust, which IMDb describes like so. Raised in a Trappist monastery, the innocent brother Ambrose sets out to find money to save the bankrupt monastery. So, 
Blues Brothers 2. Or Nacho Libre. Or Nacho Libre. We leave you now with a trailer for In God We Trust. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Now, Marty Feldman casts his keen eye for comedy on the most sacred subject since the creation of mankind. Money. That sounds wonderful. Well, then, put thy money where is thy mouth. Universal Pictures, through their divine magnificence, presents In God We Trust. God gave us his son for Christmas, so for God's sake, it's something to us. What have I got to lose? Get out of my face, will you, monk? Well, you should be disgusted with yourself. Leave me alone, you're like some holy chimney cricket. I, I feel the same way about him. This is the world of faith dealers and double dealers. If God had not meant for some people to be poorer than others, then he would not have published the Bible in paperback. Heavenly grace and a pretty face. My name's Mary. From holy vows to holy cows. If you wanted us to ignore fleshly sins, why did you make us out of meat? From punk to monk. I'm one of the meek. I'm supposed to inherit the earth. You've got it. From damnation to salvation. In other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Experience the motion picture that commands you to see the light. And find the Lord before he finds you. Find the Lord who will find the Lord. It's a wonderful game. Everybody wins. Everybody goes to heaven. Try their luck. A lousy buck to find the Lord. Aha. Now where is he? Oh, no. I'm sorry. The Lord is not there, but a blessing to you, too. In God We Trust. Starring... And now that concludes the entertainment portion of our show. And uh, for the next segment, uh, we shall all join little Moses in singing, uh, We Shall Gather by the River, whilst I partake of some communion wine and a very fine uh, Puerto Rican cigar. Yeah.